Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Derek Alderson. I'm the president of the college, and I'm joined tonight uh, with a co-chairman, uh, Professor Peter Hutchinson, far better dressed than I am, uh, far more being an individual than me, uh, who is our uh, director of uh, research at the college. Uh, tonight, we're going to focus on studies that have been performed uh, in the UK uh, by various groups uh, related to COVID and surgery. Uh, this is obviously a really important issue for us. We need to find out the results of our various research studies in order that we should be able to restore surgical services safely uh, across our National Health Service. In doing that, of course, we understand a few preliminary things. It's clear to us that we need to do our best to create environments in which there is minimal risk of patients uh, being admitted with COVID or of the patient developing COVID when they come into that uh, environment. And only in this way can we re-establish the confidence that our patients ought to be able to have if they are coming in the hospital for planned surgery. Next slide, please. Uh, we do have to make a very quick declaration of, of conflict. You can see uh, that Peter Hutchinson and myself are the only representatives of the college and that others will be providing their own view. As far as the research itself goes, then there are some individual projects where there is direct funding from the Royal College of Surgeons of England uh, for those projects. Although in general, we provide indirect funding uh, through our clinical trials network. But where there are specific funds available, then the individuals who present will tell you about that uh, as they come to their presentation. And the next one, please. Okay, thank you, Derek. Now and he'll take and, uh, yeah. and and welcome uh, welcome everybody to this webinar where we're going to present uh, some of the activities of the RCS COVID Research Group. So we founded the group um, eight weeks ago, and it, it was really in response to a recognition of the the challenges that this pandemic poses to to ourselves as surgeons and and the implications it has on on surgical care and safety. The group was convened really to bring together a number of COVID specific projects to support them, to share some ideas, collaborate and really support the research activity generally, and particularly assisting in study design, recruitment and, and to try and help with funding opportunities. And as Derek said, I think one of the main objectives is actually for us to generate data to help assist in decision making and particularly critically during the recovery phase as we, as we try and rebuild our surgical activity. Have the next slide, please. So if you Google RCS COVID Research Group, you will uh, be taken to the website which lists the studies. And currently in the portfolio, there are 38 studies. And, and this is a range of, of different studies, cohort observational studies. We have some systematic reviews, qualitative research, basic translational studies, uh, and a number of laboratory science studies. So it really, it has a very broad remit in terms of the, uh, the, the research output. It also has some projects which are very general in the terms of their focus, but then there's a number that are drilled down specialty specific. They are UK focused, but also with an international outreach. And we'll hear about some of those this evening. And they cover the whole age range from, from adults to, to pediatrics. So the next slide, please. So of those 38 projects, we've we've selected six projects uh, for this evening's webinar. Uh, well, these were really some of the earliest projects to start and, and are at various stages, but we, we hope to present some data of interest and data that will help us in terms of our decision making. So our panelists for this evening are Anil Bangu. Anil's an NIHR clinician scientist in global surgery from Birmingham. Martin Birchall, professor of Laryngology and a consultant in ENT at UCL. Jane Blaisby, Professor of Surgery at the University of Bristol. Uh, Andy Beamish, a trainee who is from Wales and is presenting on behalf of the Welsh Surgical Trainee Collaborative. Uh, we have V at Mapundi, who is 
uh, presenting on behalf of the NIHR Surgical MedTech Cooperative. And then uh, finally, Mood Buta, who is an ENT surgeon from Brighton, who is going to talk about aerosol transmission risk. So uh, without further ado, we're going to go through the, the presentations and we will save the questions for the end. And, uh, and uh, our first speaker we will now introduce is uh, Anil Bangu. If we move on to the next slide, so uh, Anil. Hello and good evening and thank you very much for um, having me to talk today. I'm, I'm here to talk about the COVID Surge Collaborative, which is a, a group of international surgeons, a very broad group of surgeons who have come together to, to, to deliver a data-driven approach to decision-making. Slide, please. Um, and this has been the, these are the broad outlines of what the response of COVID surge has been. Um, the first project looked at elective cancellations and it was a projection forward using expert responses from around the world to estimate the number of cancellations in elective surgery so we can plan. Um, the second project was the, is the COVID surge cohort study, which takes patients with a perioperative diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2. Um, the third project is the cancer model, the cancer study, and that looks at patients who had elective cancer surgery within cities that were affected by COVID. Um, and the fourth project is a workforce model, which took responses, for, again, from around the world for how much sickness was going through surgical departments so that we can plan for future surges within this outbreak. Um, the network is broad. Um, <laughs> This has re for something that we didn't think really affected surgeons at the start to something which has had a profound impact on surgical service. We've got a network of 625 centres across 69 countries and growing um, and 7,200 unique email ad addresses and 4,500 Twitter followers. Slide, please. So the first, the headlines from the first study which looked at cancelled op operations and that has been published in the British Journal of Surgery. Um, and also it, that has gained very broad media attention, which I think tells you that the public are interested and worried about this. And, and it was uh, a couple of days ago it was in The Economist. Slide, please. The headline figure from that is that we have estimated that 28 million operations, elective operations around the world have been cancelled. Um, and that includes at least 520,000 in the UK. Um, um, globally, that is comprised of 2.3 million cancelled cancer operations, which is interesting because 90% of the burden is in benign surgery. If every, if in the NHS, if we increased our capacity by 20%, it would take us 11 months to clear this backlog. But actually, what we're seeing is capacity is going down. So we need to look for solutions. Slide, please. The COVID surge cohort study is our international multi-centre study and that took patients with a perioperative SARS-CoV-2 infection and it looked at 30-day mortality. Slide please. Now these are all patients undergoing surgery and actually there are several pathways to develop this infection and then suffer a consequence. So, so the consequence in our surgical patients is, is a post-operative pulmonary or, or a post-operative pulmonary complication. That's ARDS, pneumonia, or unexpected ventilation. Um, and we tested the association with the SARS-CoV-2 infection. So one can develop it, get infected before your operation, and become symptomatic. So the C is the COVID-19 before the operation. Slide, please. One can be infected preoperatively, but become symptomatic after the operation. Slide, please. One can develop an infection and never become symptomatic. Slide, please. And then one can really get infected after the operation, which is in the hospital environment, and then develop a, a symptomatic infection after that. Slide, please. So the, the first analysis of that data includes the first 1,100 patients from 235 hospitals. And, and that includes 1,200 collaborators. And I would like to thank that very broad team. Everyone's data counts and no one's data means much without everyone else's. So we are grateful. And to the inner team, to the management team who have delivered this. Now that paper has been accepted to the Lancet um, and it's currently embargoed, but it does look like mortality with a, a perioperative SARS-CoV-2 infection 
it is far higher than one would expect outside of the pandemic. Slide, please. Um, to update you on our progress, so the, the, the data set has grown quite phenomenally, which actually reveals, it, it, it tracks the, the outbreaks around the world. So there are 12,000 patients within the data set now. Um, these are the projects that will be delivered. So in the elective cancer setting, about a third of cases were delivered through, through what are called cold units. So these are surgical services that are separated from the treatment of COVID-19 patients. And actually, there is a very strong signal that those units appear to have improved post-operative outcomes. And that is across 10 different cancer specialities. So that's broad data. We're then looking at what the components of these cold units are to give global guidance. We will be looking at risk stratification of patients with a SARS-CoV-2 infection. So you can begin to make decisions about who you do and don't operate on. We'll also look at risk stratification of operating on elective patients within outbreaks. And we will stratify that based on what your population risk is at the moment. So, so whether your population transmission rate is high or low, we'll look at the different specialties and size of operation. And really that's to say in the future, as outbreaks and surges happen, who can you continue operating on safely and who do you need to stop operating on? Um, the, the specialty lead, so we're collaborating with, with specialties, all, all of the surgical specialties, and they'll be publishing and, um, specialty specific outcome data for even more detailed guidance. Crucially from the elective data, we will be giving, we will be looking at the impact of screening and what that screening is, what the preoperative tests are, and whether they have any impact on guidance, um, on outcomes. And I think that will help guide how people stratify their tests in the future. And we'll also be looking at the effect of delayed surgery in cancer so we can guide patients over the next couple of years. Slide, please. Um, I'll just finish with a couple of future dates. So on, on June the 2nd is when the, 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 our first output, major output, the Lancet paper will be published. Um, and on May the 25th, which is on Monday, we, we will be launching, the data will be mature enough to launch some of the information on the cold units via the, web, the COVID surge webinar. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Anil, for, for the update on COVID surge. We're going to save questions to the end, as I said. So please send your questions through on the chat and then, uh, and then, and then we'll address them after all the presenters. So uh, it's a pleasure now to introduce uh, Martin Birchill, who's going to talk about the NHR Advanced Surgical Technology Incubator. Uh, Martin. Hi, sorry, it's just Jane from the yeah. events team. Um, Martin's having some audio issues, so we're just going to suggest that we move on to Jane. It's so if the um, audience you. can just bear with us for two seconds, um, and then we'll bring Martin back at the end. Great, Thank so you. in which case we'll move on to Jane Blaisby, who's Professor of Surgery at Bristol, and Jane is going to talk about the Lotus C19 study. Jane, thank you. Good evening, everybody. and. Um, it's lovely to see you all. I'm talking to you from North Somerset, from Backwell. So when status quo is broken, we need innovation. And COVID-19 broke the surgical status quo. Normality was gone and everyone was vulnerable. And it's been said here, it's been said that vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation. So how can we study this? All sorts of things have happened in the last two months. There's been guidance emerging, rapid surveys. We've heard about the last project. But we sat and we thought in Bristol, what can we do? What can we do to study what was going on? What have we got to offer here? And we decided to use qualitative research methods to study what was happening. Next slide, please. Now, qualitative research explores individuals' in-depth experiences, their private views and opinions, it's hypothesis generating, it's not hypothesis testing. And over the last seven weeks in the LOTUS study, we have conducted 41 interviews. Next slide, please. These have been with theatre staff from across the UK and worldwide from a mix of surgical specialties. The interviews have lasted on average about 40 minutes, but some have lasted more than two hours. And we found that most people really wanted to talk and one surgeon phoned the um, interviewer afterwards and said, oh, I found the whole process so cathartic. 
And here are some preliminary findings. Next slide, please. We found that the pathways and the practi practices in surgery have fundamentally changed. There's been changes in service provision, in theatre processes, and of course, with PPE. And these changes have come about through perceptions of risk and the guidance that is available. And all of this has had a huge impact on staff's physical and their mental health. I'm just gonna give you some examples. Next slide, please. Now, one ophthalmologist said that they decided they, to start asking patients undergoing surgery to wear face masks at the time of surgery, and they thought that would be beneficial. And then they noticed that as soon as that they did that, their lenses that they were operating with, that they were using, were steaming up every few minutes. So they thought, well, if it's steaming up, that must mean that the patient's breath is coming up through the mask and out of the drape that we've put on. So paradoxically, putting on a mask was possibly increasing her exposure to the surgical field rather than decreasing it. So what intuitively everyone thought was going to be helpful, they thought would maybe then become more risky. And another shift in practice that was described was about procedures being undertaken using local anaesthesia rather than traditional general anaesthesia. And they said that things that would have never been contemplated being done before under local suddenly were being done under general. For example, a nucleation of the eye was done and now it's been done very successfully. There's been loads of new innovations that have come about since the pandemic. And another area where there are lots of opinions that have been very controversial is around the published guidance. Next slide, please. To some, the guidance was initially reassuring and then in other ways they've become problematic because they're controversial and they're not based on evidence really because there hasn't been time to create the evidence and the really big topic has been should laparoscopic surgery be stopped should it be replaced with open procedures or should it continue with precautions an area where there's been a lot of positive um, there was a lot of positive um, in interview data found was around how to manage these multiple guidelines within teams and the role the important role of team working one team said that they would one person in the hospital would be responsible for reading all the guidance and digesting it and then they would disseminate the key information they described this as sort of having a command center and so they would say the external vice comes in to the command center, then it's monitored, and then we get the daily updates from that central person about what should and shouldn't be done. Other teams describe creating things called action packs with updated guidance on what to do, and they could just be grabbed that morning and taken and read on their way to theater. And there were multiple examples of positive ways of team working with consultants, suddenly using video conferences with weekly brainstorming, beneficial activities that interviewees really hoped would be sustained beyond the end of the pandemic. Next slide, please. So in summary, the LOTUS study has used qualitative methods to understand experiences and innovations of surgeons and theatre staff during the pandemic. And interviewees have been keen to talk mostly. They found the process cathartic. Analysis is ongoing, but the emerging findings are really invaluable. And we're beginning to recognize that we can use this as a data repository to generate hypotheses for future research. And we plan to write this up and share the findings as quickly as possible. Next slide, please. And we're really grateful to the whole qualitative team who've done the interviewees, the people who've transcribed all the data, and to support from the Royal College of Surgeons, Rose Trees, the Biomedical Research Centre and the Quintet team. And thank you for listening. Great, Jane, thank you very much. And, and again, demonstrating the, the power of qualitative research and, and the impact that this is having. So it's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is uh, Andy Beamish. And, Andy's going to present on behalf of the Welsh Surgical Training Collaborative. So welcome, Andy. Hmm. Sorry, Andy, we, we just can't hear you. Are you on mute, Andy? Not anymore. There we go. 
apologies. Fantastic. Andy, so, far away. Sorry about that dead time. I promise I'll keep to my five minutes. <laughs> yeah. My name is Andy Beamish. I'm a uh, surgical trainee in the Wales Deanery and I'm honorary clinical senior lecturer in Swansea University. So thank you up front to all those people who collaborated and participated in Operation COVID as a number of other speakers are talking about today. This is a collaborative project and without participants, it's nothing. It's just an idea. Um, thanks to the support for the support of the college. Operation COVID was largely born out of frustration on the, on the shop floor and it was apparent very early on that the Royal Gwent, where I'm currently working, was hit quite hard and quite early by the COVID um, outbreak. Um, and the, the ideas on the shop floor were very different from one specialism to another, from one team to another, and even within surgery. It seemed that perhaps the thing we best agreed on, on was that we disagreed. And so we set out to try and answer these questions. Um, next slide, please. The, the first project that we undertook, which was a very small group of us, was to use standard methodology that we're all very familiar with, using the PRISMA approach, to systematically review the literature regarding COVID-19 in surgical practice. And the things that we learned very quickly from that was that the themes that were in the papers were quite uh, consistent between different groups, but also the level of evidence was very low. It was largely um, eminence and experience that was being described rather than true evidence and so we worked out very quickly that traditional methods of synthesizing answers from the data were not really particularly useful so that we've published that systematic review in the BGS open which I'm very grateful to Professor Alderson for rapid peer review mm. and you can access these papers through links on our website operate opcovid.org next slide please so learning that traditional methods weren't very helpful we had to find some novel methodology that would allow us to find out what's happening based on experience and in the absence of evidence more experience is better than just a small amount and we uh, went to social media largely to find out what problems were on the shop floor what questions were people asking we ultimately then led on to do a delphi process which was single phase for haste and we were very pleased that more than 300 international experts took part and the consensus actually on most of the statements, on more than 70% of the statements, was very good. And there were clear non-consensus areas, some of which have been described already. You know, the, the idea of open being preferential to laparoscopic approaches. And you can see some on the slide, some other areas across the four domains that we identified from our systematic review. It was really pleasing to see that actually there was quite a lot of consensus. And the clear areas of non-consensus presented us with obvious research targets, which was really useful. Next slide, please. So that led us on to the guidance documents that Professor Blaisby was just talking about. And we, we selected prior to disseminating the, the single phase Delphi, we selected some prominent research, um, some prominent guidance documents and directed our statements to, to be able to systematically validate those. So we took people's statements and we address them to the specific deconstructed documents and it's really pleasing that we showed that more than 90 percent of the contents of each of these different uh, documents including our own college the joint college statement more than 90 percent of the contents were agreed upon with the consensus so the colleges are clearly and these professional bodies are clearly doing a reasonable job in the absence of evidence and also in the absence of time and the ability to, to quickly look through things as a professional body and give it to people to give them direction on the ground was precisely what we were looking for to, at the start of this whole project. Next slide, please. Okay. Thank you again to everybody who's collaborated, who's participated in it. And we did learn some lessons. You know, the main lesson I think we're all going to take away from this whole thing is that collaboration makes us stronger than working in isolation. We all know that already but it's a really timely uh, demonstration of that. There were concerns around the globe and they were very much the same regardless of the place. And it was, you know, it was encouraging to see that we're all trying to beat them in the same way. And also that the international guidance was well supported is very, is, um, is good to see. So thank you very much again to all the participants. Great, thanks very much, Andy. And, uh... And in terms of the publications, we are going to be putting a link to all the publications on the on the COVID Research Group website. So uh, thank you for your contribution. And it's a great pleasure to now uh, introduce V, who's from the Surgical MedTech Cooperative from Leeds, 
is going to present something slightly different, the PPE challenge. Over to you, V. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, so my name is V Mapunde. I'm the program manager for the Surgical MedTech Cooperative. And for those that aren't familiar with it, um, it's a bit of the NHR that looks at translating medical technology um, research as opposed to the pharmaceutical side of things. Um, so at the end of um, March, uh, next slides, please. At the end of March, we started off a PPE challenge. And the rationale behind that was we wanted to find out what um, particular issues were coming up for the surgical community. And if there were some issues that we could work through the translational pipeline um, pathway, then we would be able to resolve those and hopefully make things available um, for use um, for healthcare workers. So we did get um, quite a range of submissions. It was an online process um, and we had in total 68 submissions. Uh, the majority of those were obviously from industry. So a lot of solutions were being proposed. Um, next slide. Um, and you had most of the challenges were actually coming from um, clinical, clinical people, healthcare workers. So this slide just shows you um, sort of a, a brief summary of the types of um, both challenges and submissions that we received. The bulk of those are obviously within the PPE side. And they, these obviously ranged from supply issues all the way to, well, actually, can we make um, PPE equipment that's suitable for female um, staff to wear? Um, is there something that can validate fit checking? So we had all those types of questions and we worked through with the Royal Academy of Engineering for that as well. You had things like service delivery, where it's looking at community care, um, because that had pretty much stopped. So the vascular nurses and the wound care nurses um, wanted us to develop something that patients could use in the absence of this clinical care. But a lot of the details around these categories and some of, it, some of the examples around um, the submissions are available on our website, and the link um, is, on the last, and is on the last slide um, once I get to that, but you'll have more information there. Next slide. So I'm just going to talk, to th talk through three um, projects that we took forward from um, some of the submissions that we had. Um, so the first one is one um, we're working with the Ministry of Defence. Um, so their main um, technology is actually the spray bottle itself and is the mechanism of action which basically ensures more or less 100% coverage of any surface. And what they came to the surgical MIC um, requesting was they wanted um, guidance on what um, particular solution do they use for this bottle. And um, the two key questions that we're interested in is, can this be used in the NHS if we can find the solution, which we're able to support them with? And if we can use it within the NHS, what areas within a hospital setting would be most appropriate for this? At the moment, we're thinking through the NHS, um, you've got the private boards, you've got um, operating theatres, um, ICU um, and radiology, for example. So those are the things we will be looking at in terms of a multi-centre study later on. But to start off with, we more or less need to prove the concept, which is what a single centre implementation study is. And um, we're in the process of applying um, to, for funding from Innovate UK and that should support the scaling up once we're able to do the single centre implementation study. First. So we will be on the lookout for any volunteers um, that want to try this out. Next slide, please. The second project is one looking at doxycycline. And um, so we're putting together an application for a randomized controlled trial. And they're looking at using doxycycline as a prophylaxis for healthcare workers. Um, apparently there's loads of different options they could have gone for but they've chosen this spe um, specific uh, specific um, drug mainly because the supply issues are not constrained by anything and it's widely available um, so this is um, something we're going to apply for funding for and we're going to take that forward um, you've got the primary and secondary um, endpoints on your screen um, but one of the key things they'll be also looking to do is taking fe um, fecal swab samples at the beginning and at the end of the study and they hope this will um, help in terms of providing some sort of certainty when it comes to the data analysis. Some of these results will influence the design of some of the respirators you're looking at doing for um, developing countries. Next slide, please. Um, the final example is the Safe Surgery app. Um, so what we also got a lot um, of inquiries um, about was, well, actually, it's difficult to complete the um, World Health Organization um, surgery checklist once you've got all the PPE equipment on. 
And also if you've got the mask um, and all the full gear, then it's difficult for people to understand or hear what you're saying when in relation to completing this checklist. So they asked us to come up with a way that would make it easier um, for them to complete that. Um, and we developed um, a web-based checklist. So this can be accessed um, on any device that can get onto the internet. I have been assured that it will work for most um, internet browsers. Um, if you're using an older internet explorer, then maybe not. Um, but definitely for most of them, it, it will work. And we're obviously looking for feedback. We're interested in people testing this out to see whether it works for them, whether it's something that they can use. Um, but it was there to fulfill a, you know, a, a problem that people were having um, in the immediate um, point. Next slide. Um, and finally, these are the two links I was talking about. So the April 2020 newsletter has got, um, it's a very extensive newsletter. So it's got all the information about all the studies and all the requests that we received and all the offers of support from companies. And the website itself, we've got a dedicated web page where you can actually look through each of those challenges and solutions and get to see where we are with regards to whether we took them forward. Some of them don't need taking forward because they're outside our remit. Um, so there's just the contact details and if people are interested, they can get in touch with those. But um, from the clinical and surgical community, if anyone's interested in any of those um, solutions or challenges listed on there, then definitely please contact us um, and we'll be able to put you in touch with the relevant people. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, V, and for presenting some interesting ideas and we look forward to seeing how these, how these develop in the future. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Mahmoud Butta, who's Honorary Professor in ENT from Brighton, and this is going to be slightly different. This is talking about how we can mitigate uh, aerosol transmission risks. So over to you, Mood. Thank you, Hutch. So um, first of all, let me thank the College Memorial Fund, who has uh, put some funding in towards this work uh, through the college. Um, so next slide, please. So this is really related to uh, risk, particularly to, to health workers and, and surgeons and anaesthetists. Um, and we understand that the main mechanism for the SARS-CoV-2 virus to be transmitted is probably airborne, although surface um, transmission is also possible. And the, the, the airborne transmission is through both aerosols and droplets. So just to clarify, uh, the, the, the normal cutoff is that a, an aerosol is um, a particle that's below um, uh, five micrometers in size, whereas a droplet is larger than that. What we found, what, what the emerging research, not our research, but from other um, laboratories is finding that there's infrequent recovery of infective virus in hospital air samples. So, so that's good, reassuring that in general, in air samples in the hospital, we're not finding the virus. However, what we do understand is that people are particularly at risk. We understand that anaesthetists uh, are particularly at risk and ENT surgeons as well are also at risk. We don't know what that risk is, but what we understand from the SARS, the, uh, the, the this uh, Eastern and Southeast um, Asian uh, pandemic, those who are undertaking tracheal intubation have a six times increased risk of uh, getting the disease, and those undertaking tracheostomy have a four times uh, increased risk of getting the disease, which implies that those sorts of procedures are creating aerosols containing virus. So obviously what we're concerned about is the presence of virus in a particular tissue and the aerosolization of it, which puts healthcare workers at risk. We can use PPE to protect ourselves, but what we're trying to look at is where and how that PPE should be used or whether there's other mechanisms in yeah. particular that mitigate that risk. So we understand that there's air, well, aerosol is probably generated from airway examination or instrumentation, but actually what's surprising is there's very, very little research on this area. There's been about two or three studies that have looked at this and they've only looked at one or two procedures. So again, the whole risk is we're dealing with during this whole pandemic is an unknown risk and, and making judgment calls. So we're unclear whether ENT surgeons, um, um, anaesthetists or other healthcare personnel are at risk because of their proximity to the source. Is it just the number of patients you're seeing and being very close to the mouth? Because even talking, as I'm talking now, if you look at it, I'll be generating huge amounts of aerosols actually. Or is it a risk specific instrumentation? Is it that ENT surgeons inserting something into the airway and creating more, more risk or anaesthetics? Next slide, please. So this is what Public Health England have classified as aerosol generating procedures, but actually, to be honest, it's based upon very little evidence and it's, it's, it's a guess. I know that the college has also put forward some other ideas, such as uh, whether laparoscopic 
um, surgery is well in these aerosol generating whether the uh, peritoneal cavity contains a virus is unclear uh, and, and I think there's also concerns about drilling other tissues such as in orthopedics um, so what we're trying to do is look at this list and, and, and try to understand a bit more next slide please so this is just um, what, what, what do we have so far? We actually have very little information and we're trying to get some, some bigger funding to look at aerosol generation in all of these procedures. It's not as easy as you might think. Um, when I started out, I thought it would be easy, but it's not that easy. Here is a, is, is a, a slide that was produced uh, um, by some researchers in the US who actually simulated intubation. And what they did was they sprayed something coming out um, from a simulated intubation and you can see that this fluorescent marker is all over the face and mask of this particular person however these are droplets because these are large particles we had known nothing about the aerosols um, because aerosols are five microns the human eye can only see up to 40 microns so this is invisible risk that we cannot see next slide please so the specific specific work and very much this is work in in, in progress is that we are doing some laboratory-based work, we're actually simulating aerosols. So these aerosols can be created in uh, aerosol laboratories around the, the UK. Um, and we can then look at how we can, uh, where those aerosols dissipate and how we can try and extract those. But we also ideally want to actually look at characterization of aerosols in aerosol generating procedures, such as intubation, such as tracheostomy, looking uh, at what's actually happening in reality, where those aerosols are going. But more important than that even is perhaps a design and trial prototype devices which can perhaps, perhaps extract those aerosols at source um, and so reduce further the risk to our healthcare personnel. We're also interested in finding out if some of these so-called aerosol generating procedures actually don't generate aerosols, in which case we can step down perhaps our precautions to an appropriate level. So this work is in collaboration with, uh, well, uh, several professors of aerosol science from Manchester, Leeds and Cambridge and I'm grateful to them for the support that they provided. Next slide please. So I'd like to tell you that we've got the solution but actually we don't. It's, um, it's lots and lots of prototypes and we're actually going through a number of different iterations of possibilities. Um, what I can say is we're, we're at the stage where we're thinking about creating something around our head with a simple extraction and possibly also a heat source gun, a gun that will fire hot air across the face or wherever you're operating so creating what's effectively an air curtain it will fire something across and it'll be sucked out the other end what's interesting is we found that the medical suction the wall-based suction just isn't strong enough and we're actually trialing things with vacuum cleaners at the moment um, which i think is a good option because potentially it could be scalable also to low resource settings which is another interest of ours so um watch this space and thank you Great, Mood. Thanks very much. Fascinating and uh, real potential to change the, the way we work and, and in terms of to try and to, to protect us from this. So um, before our final speaker, I think Martin is now on. Please keep sending your questions. Uh, you can either send a question for a specific panelist or for the whole panel. So please make that clear when you ask your question. And uh, we will now move on to our final speaker, who's Martin Birchall. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, Derek. And uh, I'll um, be talking about um, some work that we've been doing in the NHR Royal College of Surgeons Advanced Technology Incubator. Um, so next, please. And the next slide. Thank you. Um, so uh, NHR is that part of uh, so the, the um, NHR Academy is that part which is responsible for career development in research um, and the incubators were set up to target areas of specific need. Next slide please. Uh, the incubator in advanced surgical technology was um, approved in the early part of this year just before the outbreak um, and is comprised of uh, multidisciplinary professional groups who are involved in theatre practice um, and we have people from around the UK. Next slide please. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, it's national. Um, we have the Surgical Mech in Leeds, we, uh, from whom we've heard already today, um, and also the BRC in Surgery that Jane Blaisley leads in Bristol. Um, roboticists from Leeds and Bristol. Um, B Brown, or an industrial partner uh, in Sheffield. Uh, Florence Nightingale Centre in uh, Cambridge with uh, Peter's Brain Mick, 
um, the Royal College of Surgeons of England and the UCLH Student Surgical Society. Next, please. Uh, when we started out, uh, we had um, a series of questions which were kind of for the pre-COVID world and we thought we would be particularly supporting career development in these areas, uh, supporting the development of surgical technology. So pre clinical frameworks, health economics, QA and standards, team learning, and particularly support for research active theatre team career structures. There's a, a big gap in bringing through our theatre nurses and ODPs and clinical scientists um, in the same way that surgeons are, are supported. Next, please. But of course, everything's changed. Um, COVID's taught us a lot about the way we have to approach surgery in the future. Um, and I hopefully, at least at this moment in time, and certainly on Thursday nights at uh, eight o'clock, the world seems to recognize the importance of educated, flexible healthcare staff. Um, we have been shown to be over-dependent on outdated systems and the rapid use of various bits of communication technology has, has shown that. Um, and many of the old paradigms are also being tested so there are lots of natural experiments, such as trying um, short course radiotherapy for things that we've normally cut out. Um, and looking back at this time, we'll find that some of the things we were forced to do won't be good and some of them will be good. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting time technologically. Uh, we also realized that all members of surgical teams need to be technology savvy at some level. Next, please. So um, what are the post-COVID questions? Well. We don't know exactly, but these are some of the ones that we could start with. How can we make the best use of existing technology in a world that's going to be dramatically different in its appreciation of risk, uh, reduction of infection, and the amount of money that's going to be around? So looking at repurposing of tech, new combinations, uh, and looking at late technology readiness level um, development of technologies in R&D uh, with industry and with universities. Uh, what are the surgical team human resource needs for the future? Um, if we haven't got as many people around as we need, how can we redistribute better what we've got? Uh, how will the med tech industry be changing as well? Uh, will there be um, less of a push for robotics or what we think is going to happen, more of a push for robotics to push the surgeons and the team further away from the patient? What are the most efficient, fastest pay, uh, ways of testing? And what QA and standards will serve the new needs and priorities in the new world? Next, please. So we've been doing, uh, uh, next slide, please. So we've been doing various parts of uh, research uh, related to COVID in the various parts of the uh, network. Um, uh, so you've already heard from Jay, who's been performing the wonderful Lotus 19 study. Um, and this has directly fed into some of the other things that we, we hope to do in the future. Um, you've already heard from um, the Leeds group about their app and the um, brilliant um, COVID uh, PPE challenge that they did. Um, and one of the things that has grown out of both the PPE challenge and Jane's work has been the realisation that communication in the operating theatre is not as good as it can be when you're in full PPE. And this actually increases time, um, increases the chances of communication errors and potential risk and poorer outcomes. Um, the last thing that we um, want to do is a surgical technology uh, Delphi process, uh, which will hopefully um, produce a defined list of priorities for the development of surgical technology in years to come. Next, please. So the uh, co op com study. Um, derived, as I say, from our um, looking at the experiences of theatre teams all around the world and in the UK. And communicating in full PPE is difficult, and any of us who've tried it will, will know that. Uh, where communication uh, is poor, studies have shown that this introduces um, errors, which can result in poorer outcomes. Um, we've been able to rope in um, Apple UK, um, some aspects of Microsoft, and a technology company called MRTC who supply uh, the uh, pit crews for Formula One motor racing uh, with effective comms. And we performed some um, trials of competing technology um, under the, um, the umbrella of service improvement. So no actual formal randomized trials, um, no direct patient involvement, but service improvement at this stage. Uh, what we're now doing is we're collecting together the experiences of the theatre teams um, 
and uh, combining that with our um, uh, literature review um, and um, also the further outputs of the local study to um, determine what will be the ideal specifications for Tier 13 communication in the future, which we can then put to various um, technology partners and um, engineering departments and push forward to see if we can actually develop something which is not only good for the now, but will be a perfect specification for the future, COVID and beyond. By the way, I apologise for the photograph. I appreciate I'm not wearing gloves. This is in the bar mock-ups. So that is definitely not how to wear PPE, just in case anybody's wondering. Next, please. Uh, just a reminder of the um, Surgical Safety WHO app, which we're now using from Leeds. It's really good, so do download it and give it a go. Next slide, please. And, and that's it. And anybody who wants to know more about the, um, the work of the uh, incubator, uh, then please drop me a line. Um, and thank you very much. Great. Thanks very much, Martin. I think we all know the challenges of trying to uh, communicate in full PPE. So, uh, so anything that you can do to assist that would be appreciated. So that ends um, the formal presentations for the panel. Thanks to the panel. What's amazing is how much has been achieved. Remember that this is a relatively short time that we've been living with this and, uh, and, and there's been significant progress. So uh, I'm going to kick off with the first question just to get us warmed up and then uh, We'll, we'll open it up to everybody and please keep sending your questions via the chat. So the, the question I'd like to ask the panel is, you know, research can often be difficult to deliver. What, what sort of been the greatest challenge in delivering the research in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic? What have been the particular difficulties that, that you've all encountered? What we're going to do is myself and Derek are going to disappear from the screen now and we're going to put all our panelists up uh, in order to uh, to progress with the question so so challenges of delivering research in the in, in the COVID-19 era Who, who'd like to kick off with that well I, I can I can if you like I mean for me the on. biggest challenge has been this sorry can you hear me yes Martin yes yeah, so the biggest, it, it, yeah. the biggest challenge for me is yeah the biggest challenge for me has been the sheer speed so we haven't had time to sit back and do leisurely research uh, proposal preparation um, and, you know, six months to a year of ethics and R&D and everything else. And, and it, it's, it's just been the sheer speed with which we've had to move in order to keep up with things. That's great. And, you know, I think if one thing comes out of this, if we can really streamline re approval processes, research and get the timelines really short, it would, it would be a big step forward. Would any of the other really comment? Well, I was going to say, um, I, I agree with that. I think the speed has been the greatest challenge, but also what's been heartening is that if you speak to anyone, um, certainly, you know, even outside of medicine, that people are just so willing to get on and help um, and support, which has been really heartening to get things done. I think from, from our end, it has it's, it's just the capacity. Um, for a lot of the solutions we're receiving, there's just no way of testing them because all the labs are shut or they've got a huge waiting queue um, line or you know it's funding. So I think for us, it was more to do with the capacity to actually un carry forward a lot of the stuff. Nevertheless, you've got some great projects taken, taken forward. Anil, have you got any thoughts? Yeah, I would echo um, that one of the positive legacies from all this will be the international approvals processes, which have been faster and streamlined. I, I think they will inevitably slow a little bit when when the volume of generalism comes back. But actually, I think there's a will not to go back to some of the bureaucracy and, and to keep with streamlined systems. And I've also observed that in the journals, and, and I know there's been um, you know, some criticism directed at the journals and the Lancet responded to some of that criticism today in public. But actually, I, I think my interactions with the journals have been phenomenal and, and it's far easier now to to speak to um, an, an editor and, and, and actually get some guidance than, than perhaps in the pre-COVID era, which I don't think is the will of the editors. I just think things like Zoom and the, the need to do things have broken down barriers that previously existed. So I hope those are legacies that remain. And I think as research leaders and participants, we have, have the responsibility to, to try and keep those as well as delivering our own work. 
Great, thank you. Uh, I think interaction with the journals is, is critical and I, I think there have been advances already. Jane, have you got any thoughts? Yeah, so we've been um, coordinating all this research with the qualitative team who are based all at home, some of whom have got their families and dependents to look after, and they've been making international phone calls all sorts of times of the day and night to get these interviewees' opinions. And that was initially really challenging. And like everyone else has said, a huge amount of work has gone on in two months. Normally, it would take over a year to get 45 interviews, and, and they're all analysed as well now. So there's been a lot of coordination and communication and goodwill and support. And the interviewees have been brilliant too. And I wanted to thank people who've been prepared to be interviewed and share their personal views. So it was very challenging, but I think it's settling down now. Yes, yeah, certainly a very different way of working, but we're all getting familiar with these, the, the Zoom and, and, uh, and, and other ways of communicating. Absolutely. Andy, have you got any thoughts, please? Yeah, well, certainly from our perspective, I think the, the greatest challenge has probably been the same as the greatest strength, and that's the need, the absolute need for collaboration. I think that's where we've every single one of these projects is as strong as it is because of collaboration. I think it's we already knew, led by the trainees some, some time ago, that collaboration is coming to the fore in surgery and it's really strengthening our position. But this has demonstrated how actually none of this could have happened without collaboration. And I think it's it's just shown our true colours as a community that there's so much you can achieve in a short amount of time when the sum of your parts is greater than your number. Yeah, and, and yet again, you know, it's the, it's the trainees who are often leading this. So uh, congratulations on what you're doing and, and the Welsh Collaborative and the other collaboratives. So uh, we're going to hand over to Lucy now. Lucy, how are we doing with the uh, with the questions? Can you hear me? Yes, yep. we can. Yeah, great, lovely. Thank you. So questions are coming in. So um, to start off with, we've got a question for Anil. Um, is the increased mortality post surgery in patients who contract contact the disease in post operative phase due to altered immunity from surgery? And if so, how long does this go on for? Shall we therefore be isolating all patients who have a GA and how long for? The, the thank you for that question, um, which is a very considered question. So there are two components to this. Firstly, the mortality in elective and emergency and the mortality in preoperative and postoperative diagnoses are not that different, which is interesting. Typically, pneumonias in elective patients ha have been quite low grade and they've been a major problem in emergency surgery. But our data shows that that's no longer the case. And this this phenotype of a SARS-CoV-2 infection that becomes symptomatic is aggressive in surgical patients. Secondly, regarding the timing of diagnosis, approximately 15% of the diagnoses seem to happen after discharge. And that might be some um, delay from, a, from an in-hospital infection becoming systematic, but it might be that some of these patients are developing them within 30 days of an operation once back in the community. So our next phase of, of uh, one of the key papers we're looking to get out will be to see who that group of patients are. So for example, if the lap coles are not that group of patients, then they can be discharged early and back to, to life without isolation. If it's the major surgery that is that type of, uh, uh, of problem, then, then we will be recommending that they self-isolate for the moment. I think people have to do what, what is safest based on the individual patient without perfect guidance, but that guidance will emerge quickly over the next few weeks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think this is probably more of a, um, a, a question for the whole panel. So um, how do we make it clear that hospitals have a, a major role in um, the spreading of the infection? Um, I'm worried that rooms are still full of unnecessary staff. Um, can I can I have a, a point on that? Go for it, Martin. Uh, yeah, so I, I think you're absolutely right. I, and I think one of the goals of, of the incubator will be to try and uh, minimise um, the number of staff that we actually have to have in a theatre. Um, one of the things that we're doing, actually, this is an Imperial College idea. This is James Kimross's study rather than mine, is we're using something called HoloLens, which is a Microsoft um, virtual reality headset. Um, it's overpowered for what you need it for, but it means that we can conduct ward rounds, even on COVID wards, with one person. 
um, who has a camera which is high resolution and all the audio and you can actually beam everything back. Uh, and so the amount of uh, man hours, sorry, person hours, think of, exposure of staff to COVID patients is minimized. Um, it's expensive and it's in its early days. And actually, as I say, it's overpowered. So, but I, I see some form of technological solution being the way forward for this, even if you just use an iPad. I think maybe I can make a comment as well. I, from on the trainees' perspective, you know, we we go through numerous iterations of rotors, and you know, the brand new COVID rotor, and then the second iteration, and the third, and the fourth. And you know, every time you change a rotor, it's quite disruptive to not only patient care, but also to the participants of the rotor and all of the knock-on effects on their families and things. And as we're in the Gwent, where we were hit quite hard, we're we're now leaving the the worst part of it for now. And the temptation, you know, is to is to change things drastically so i think for the whole world moving forward we're going to have to think about how we do things differently even when covid is not a huge problem you know this do you bring back the old rotors or do you actually continually try to you know shield certain people or everybody i think it's a really important thing that we need to we need to look at quite closely in an organized way not just assuming things that we don't understand fully Okay, thank you. So a question on the surgical checklist app. How does this differ from completing it in the standard way and how does it help? Um, so in terms of, um, so forgive me because I'm, I'm not a clinical person, but the way that was presented to us is at the moment that's, comp that's pen and paper. And what the people who submitted this were finding was once you've got all the PPE in, it's very difficult to actually start using a pen and writing things down and ticking things down using that. So it takes longer and they didn't think it was, obviously it, it wasn't that convenient for that situation. So what they asked us to do was, is there not a, a way to make it electronic? And basically it's just an electronic version of that. And you should be able to, I think, either save something as a PDF, save the entry as a PDF, which can then be downloaded um, and save with the, mode, or save with the patient records. So that, that is where, that is the rationale for developing that. So my understanding is the only difference is this is electronic compared to the pen and paper way of doing things. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think this is probably a question for Hutch or Derek. Um, how about the College Fund PhD fellows focusing on COVID-19? <laughs> so Derek, do you want, I, I mean, I, yes, I have a view on that. So that's something we're thinking about at the moment. We're looking at the at, at the current fellowships that we're clearly keen to support, but we recognise that life is very different. So we are quite motivated to look at some specific uh, fellowships in relation to COVID, and also um, looking at how we can work with the clinical effectiveness unit and some of the HES data in, in terms of answering some of the other questions. So you know, I think we all recognise a move towards more COVID-funded research at the colleges is the way forward. Uh, yeah, I, can you hear me all right? Um, yes. I, I support that really. One of the things though that we mustn't forget is the effect that COVID has had on people who are already doing their research and where laboratories have often struggled or even closed uh, because of staffing issues uh, around uh, the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, we mustn't uh, forget, as a college, our responsibility to those people who've already started their research, who almost certainly will require some extra time now in order to complete their non-COVID research. So uh, we mustn't forget that there's an awful lot of stuff that's not related to COVID that's still out there, that still has to be researched. Uh, it's it just as important. So we have a bit of a problem trying to solve all of that as a college, but we will do. And if there's any fellows out there who, who are concerned, then uh, please get in touch with, with Sarah King. Uh, we are very motivated to, to support you, as Derek says. OK, so um, one more question, I think, because we're just um, just after um, seven o'clock. Um, so I think uh, Martin perhaps touched on some of this. So we have focused entirely on the negative impact of COVID on surgery during the pandemic. Large data sets documenting this in the hope that this would experience would generate new ideas. China was able to deliver a normal cancer surgical service and Italy a near normal cancer service. Why has the UK been badly affected by COVID? 
and do we need to change the way we deliver surgical services in the future to prevent this? I think that's probably one. I mean, I well, I mean, on the basis of the data that we are acquiring, uh, it's quite clear that we do need to bring in some changes uh, if we are to deliver effective surgical services that include cancer services in the future. Um, we will need, obviously, to create hubs, centres, units, uh, hospitals that are relatively free from COVID. That is COVID, we call them COVID light areas. And obviously, that cannot be in every institution for some time to come. So yes, we will have to change things, we will have to reorganize in order that we can deliver safe surgical services. So some of the ideas that people are talking about, uh, about reorganization of services, some of them will be good ideas that will work in certain parts of the country better than others. And we need to try and discover which ones work well uh, and how widely can they be applied. Yeah, can, can I make a comment as well? So, mm. so yeah, I mean, yeah, Derek, Derek's entirely right with all that, of course. Um, I, I think so. One of the we've tried to um, in our um, cancer collaborative tried to drill down to what are the immediate issues, um, and one of the biggest ones is is going to be um, patients' own weighing up their sense of risk um, based on the most amazingly confusing sets of data. There was a paper in the Lancet on the 4th of, um, 4th of April from Wuhan suggesting that the majority of, of patients who undergo surgery die. We know now from Annual's work that that's not the case, but the figures can be very high internationally. Actually, uh, figures which are going to be published in the next few weeks from um, the, uh, the, one of the hubs in London uh, suggests that we're doing reasonably well, actually. Um, certainly in terms of the immediate outcomes um, of, of readmissions and early deaths. But those are very early days and we clearly need to keep collecting the data and, and following the cohorts through. But we equally need to be able to tell patients, give them a, a proper sense of what the real risks are of coming in for their cancer surgery or even turning up for imaging, balanced against things like going to Sainsbury's or coming on the London Tube. And, and I think that's a really important message to get out there, that we are open for business. Okay. Thanks very much. A couple much. more slides to go through. Uh, yeah, just to finish uh, this evening, uh, I hope that everyone's found it useful. Just a few very quick slides, announcements really at the end. Uh, I would remind you of Mental Health Awareness Week. Uh, the fact that uh, the mental health of the surgical community uh, and our patients is uh, very important to us. I think we underestimate uh, sometimes our resilience uh, as a group of surgeons. Uh, it's allegedly not in our nature to uh, suffer from uh, these problems, but of course it's a myth. Uh, we're no different from anybody else. And we've got to remember that many of our patients uh, who present to us, whether it's uh, urgent care or whether we're talking about uh, more complex things like cancer. Uh, these people have been uh, living uh, with social distancing and isolation uh, uh, for some period of time now. Uh, and not surprisingly, uh, their mental health uh, is uh, considerably affected uh, by the crisis. So uh, we, we have uh, our a support helpline for surgeons and for members and fellows of the college, uh, which we would draw your attention to if you need it. The next one, please. Uh, this is the details of the uh, confidential support and advice service. You can see the numbers there. It's 24-7, 365 day service. And um, if you can't obtain uh, direct advice from one of our counsellors, then we will make arrangements for you to have appropriate peer-to-peer -peer 
advice uh, following disclosure of some basic details in order to find the best person to help you. And finally, the advert for next week. Uh, next week, uh, uh, we're going to focus on uh, lessons learned from other countries. Uh, it will be chaired by Neil Mortensen, uh, our president-elect, and I hope that you uh, can tune in again next week and learn some more about this problem and what we're doing as a college to try and solve things. My sincere thanks to the urbane Peter Hutchinson uh, for his excellent chairmanship. My thanks to all of the presenters. And uh, for those of you who submitted questions, we'll try and uh, make some responses uh, on our website so that uh, you can uh, see what we think for things that we couldn't deal with immediately this evening. Thank you very much indeed for your time and good night. Thank you, everybody. Night. Thank you.